Ben Kinnear. So it is my true honor to introduce Dr. Ben Kinnear, who's um, just a renowned educator. He is an associate professor in pediatrics. He is the associate program director in internal medicine and in med peds at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He has a long history of learning. Uh, I saw that he did his bachelor's um, at St. Louis University, his medical degree at the University of Missouri, Columbia School of Medicine. He did his med peds residency and chief residency at Cincinnati Children's and University of Cincinnati. He got his medical of it, medic, he got his master's of education at University of Cincinnati. And as a lifelong learner, he's now getting his PhD in validity and thinking about argumentation theory um, at, Maast at Maastricht University uh, School of Pro Health Professions Education. He's thought about many aspects of medical education um, and is extremely focused on assessment and how do we really know that we're uh, properly assessing our, our learners and that we're preparing them in the best possible ways. He has published extensively. He has won numerous teaching awards, both locally and nationally. Um, he was a Macy Scholar, which is one of the most prestigious medical education fellowships, faculty fellowships that exist. And the thing that I appreciate most about you, Ben, is that um, despite all those things, or, or maybe because of all those things, you have such a wonderful questioning mind. And at dinner last night, you were, um, and all of us were engaging in like challenges of medical education and that you were looking for your nemesis to help challenge you. Um, and I think really great scholars are willing to, to really invite others in to challenge the way we're thinking and to stretch the way we're thinking. And so to me, that is um, that curiosity and that willingness to question dogma is such an incredible skill. So we're so thrilled to have you here today. And with no, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ben Kinnear. Thank you so much, Dr. Blankenberg. Thank you for such an amazing introduction. Nothing, uh, nothing revs up one's imposter syndrome quite like a, a kind introduction. Um, I was looking for my nemesis last night. Somebody said they had a nemesis and I said, I would love a nemesis. So if any of you are looking for a nemesis, I'm a good one to have. And the last comment I'll make is whenever, whenever Becky said, uh, He's been learning for a long time. I think that's just code that I'm getting old, uh, which might be true. All right, well, good morning. I am so, so, so excited to be here with you today. Um, I've never been to the Bay Area. And I have to say, as somebody who's never been here, in Cincinnati, we look at Stanford really as like the leader in medical education because you have thought leaders, you have research leaders, you have coaching and mentoring leaders. And when I say leaders, I mean like nationally known people and so to come here and to have some of these discussions and meet some of you is a real treat. I'm super, super excited. Um, and you might say, this guy seems excited, but his topic looks a little like a bummer. Um, and I hope it's not a bummer. It's not meant to be a bummer. So in fact, I think maybe the first thing we should do is tell you how this talk came to be. And so what I wanna acknowledge is this talk is actually a variation and an evolution of a workshop that I gave with some of my colleagues uh, a few years ago at an international medical education conference. And we developed it because um, we were angry and we were frustrated with some of the things that we saw happening. Um, and we were trying to build a burning platform for change. We weren't just trying to complain. We were trying to get people to care enough to jump in with us and do something different. Um, if any of you have ever done change management, you know, unless you tell a story that gets people upset, people are not going to help, help out and join you. So that's what we were doing. We made a list of all the things that made us frustrated. Um, and so I adapted it to bring to you today, even though the list is much longer than 10, I chose 10 just to fit within the time and to have this discussion with you. I didn't want you to think I'm like an education nihilist who thinks education doesn't matter. In fact, the opposite. I think medical education is maybe one of the most powerful tools we have to improve the healthcare of our patients. I think it's not the only solution, but I think it has to be part of the solution. So I want this to be a hopeful talk, not a downer of a talk. Now, another thing I wanna put out there is people have said harms is a really harsh word, kind of harsh, and it almost sounds like it's intentional. And I'm using harms in a very broad sense. So I have a clip uh, of, um, uh, <laughs> I'm doing that well. Um, I have a clip that as I was going through some old photos made me think about what do I mean in terms of harms. So this is actually 
my beautiful wife, Maya, and my two children playing at a park in Cincinnati. I still remember this day, even though it was like three years ago. So it was so perfect. You know, those perfect days where you can still remember it and you wish you could go back there. And my youngest daughter, Mila, is trying to climb this hill. She's doing her best. And to me, when I think of harms, I think of trying, you know, our learners, whether it's medical students, residents, fellows, even faculty, trying to climb the hill of gaining competence or building a professional identity. And as programs and systems, we are trying to help them along without doing it for them. So what you see here is my wife is like trying to support my daughter while she's trying to figure it out. And she's, you know, kind of grabbing her butt cheek and kind of moving her leg and like, you know, doing her best, right? We're doing our best. And in the end, unfortunately, my daughter didn't quite make it. And this is one kind of way when I say harms, I mean, when our systems are doing our best, but we're not set up for success. And then, and then that's just what happens, right? So it's not an intentional thing. It's just the way things are set up and can we do better? But there are some harms, I think, that are a little bit like this, where we're just putting our learner's face right in the astroturf. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about both kinds of harms today, all right? Uh, but the good news at the end that I want to point out is our learners, just like my daughter, are so resilient, so bright, so driven and hardworking that even despite all the dysfunction and harms that we might talk about today, they almost always find their way to the top of the hill. They almost always make it because they're just so brilliant. So I'm, I'm not saying that our learners aren't in a good place. They do. They go out and they provide good care. This is about can we do a better job? Somebody just clapped for my daughter. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, she rolled right back down uh, just after that. But, but the point is to say, um, can we do better? Can we make the climb easier so maybe they can climb farther? Can we support them better? Okay, so this is not a downer talk, but you are gonna hear me rage a little bit at the beginning. I only have these disclosures. There's a couple of uh, education grants that I'm part of and I'll reference some of that work. So I wanna be upfront about that. And here are my objectives. If I can get you to just think about and identify harms that you see in medical education, even if they're different than the ones I talk about, I think that's a win because then you can build your own burning platforms. And then make sure that you link those burning platforms to change. So otherwise you're just complaining and that doesn't help anybody. Here are the harms I chose to bring to you today. Um, I'm not gonna read them for you because we're gonna go through them one by one. I'm gonna spend a couple of slides on each one saying why I think it was a harm, why my colleagues thought it was a harm and kind of laying it out for you. And then we're gonna take a pause in the middle and I'm gonna ask you to look to the person next to you and talk about which of these harms resonated with you the most or maybe made you the most angry or which harms are missing that you think should be up here. So I want you to take that moment of reflection in the middle. And then, so we don't end on a dour note, the second half of this talk, I'm gonna shift and I'm gonna talk about um, what did we try to do in Cincinnati to mitigate some of these harms? Not, in, not saying that Cincinnati got it right, but just as an example of, if you're gonna build a burning platform, you better do something with it. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Are you ready? Ready to hear me go off? Okay. So first one, education harms learners when it fails to connect education with clinical outcomes. You know, we spend so much time at the bedside with our learners. We watch them giving care. In fact, on a lot of our clinical teams, they're the ones providing most of the care. And then we give these ratings about how we think they do. But in reality, we don't know the quality of care that they deliver and nor do they. It's so siloed and it's opaque and it's really hard to tease out. And as a result, our learners believe that they're not responsible for care outcomes. Now, I don't mean that they don't think what they do matters. Although interestingly, we're doing a qualitative study in Cincinnati right now, and they kind of don't know if what they do matters because they don't see care outcomes. But what I mean is when we talk about care on a broader sense, do you think your learners look at these kind of things like the hospital you know, infection rates or mortality rates, all these things and feel connected to that? In Cincinnati, they don't. And in a lot of the places I visit, they don't because they don't see the outcomes of their care. And when they hear about disparities in care, I think a lot of our learners say, yeah, I believe there are disparities in care. Do you think they personally feel attached to that? I don't think they do because they do not see the outcomes of their care and we don't know them either. And this is even more important in terms of accountability to the public because the patterns in quality of training become the patterns in quality of physicians after training. There are so many studies that are popping up that show whether you're talking about obstetrical outcomes, surgical outcomes, patient centeredness, high value care, the type of care you learn to deliver during training will follow you for decades out into practice. 
we are imprinting on our learners. And the problem is we don't know what we're imprinting. We don't know what kind of care they're, they're taking out and neither do they. We need to get rid of this kind of disconnect and this siloing. Education harms learners when it promotes poor learning strategies. How many of you, when you started your journey in medical education, somebody sat you down and said, how do you learn? Do you know the best strategies to learn? What's most effective? Maybe that happened here because this is an amazing place. Didn't happen in Cincinnati. Doesn't happen most places I go, and I'm not alone. When you go into the literature across health professions, whether it's learners or whether it's faculty, people don't know what the best strategies to learn are. They never teach us. And this is really hard because number one, there's a lot to learn. And number one, we forget a lot. Have you all ever seen this curve before? The Ebbinghaus forgetting curve? If you haven't seen it, it's a famous curve that people reference a lot because it's so ridiculous, but it's true. It was actually put out in 1885 by a guy named Herman Ebbinghaus, published a paper by memorizing a list of words and then saying, how long can I remember that list of words? It was much easier to get published in 1885. <laughs> I would have an amazing CV if I could do studies like this. Um, but what you can see is, I'm gonna check out this amazing pointer. Does it work? Oh, it does. You can see after one hour, he remembered less than 50% of the words. And at a month out, he was almost at 20%. Now this just wasn't old Herman. This has been reproduced over and over and over again. We are built to forget. And that's okay. Well, you, if you come to my workshop later, you'll see that's actually part of learning. But the problem is there are strategies that you can employ in your learning to more efficiently learn and to hang on to it longer so that learning doesn't look like this, just putting sand into a sieve. This is, this is also my daughter. This is the daughter that got her face smashed into the turf. I don't know if this and that are related, but, um, <laughs> but when we promote poor learning strategies, our learners waste precious time on their learning when they could, they could spend their time better. The next harm, education harms learners when it provides perverse incentives, grades over growth. I want all of you who are uh, physicians, or even not, if you're a different health professional, the first time you were on your clinical clerkship, what was your number one goal when you walked onto the wards? Probably to perform, to get great, to get honors, right? Yes, you wanted to take good care of patients. Yes, you wanted to learn, but your number one goal was to get honors. Why? Because so much of your life depended on getting honors and getting a letter, right? It was so important. It depends on what kind of physician can you be? Where do you spend the next several years of your life? It was really hard. And what happens when we put this performative pressure on our learners, they snap into a fixed mindset. I know there's a session later today on coaching for growth mindset. I think that's one of the most important things we can do for our learners is to try to get them out of this fixed mindset. And if you're not familiar with it, a fixed mindset is where failure is a threat. A failure is terrible. And so what you do is you put on a cloak of competence. You always try to look smart. You're not curious. You don't take chances with your learning. You don't push yourself because the goal is just to look as smart as possible. And feedback is a threat rather than an opportunity. The problem is so many of our systems in medical education push us toward fixed mindset and really harm our learners. Education harms learners when we lack a cohesive assessment and coaching strategy. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's really hard to do good assessment. Uh, it's really, really hard. But it might be one of the most important things we can do because we cannot self-assess. Have any of you ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect or the Kruger-Dunning effect? Um, if you've never actually seen the data, this is what it looks like. It's kind of funny. This is uh, checking uh, lots of people across multiple different domains. And what you'll see here is whether it's humor, reasoning ability, or grammar, obviously there's a spectrum, right? There's the lowest quartile and the highest quartile. That's what you're seeing in those light lines there. But the dark lines are the self-perceived uh, self performance. And everybody thinks they're just above average. If you ask people about driving, everybody thinks they're about average or just above average and everybody else is a bad driver. But it's not true. We stink at self-assessment. Uh, and if you think that we're immune because we're highly educated physicians, you're wrong. Because when you look in the physician literature, the preponderance of evidence suggests that we have a limited ability to accurately self-assess. So if we don't have robust assessment systems and coaching programs to help our learners internalize that, then our learners are unaware of their weaknesses. And just as importantly, they're unaware of their strengths. Because I think we focus on weaknesses because we think that's a like, highest risk thing. But I think it's also terrible if our learners don't know what they're great at, because it's important to celebrate your strengths and it's important to share your strengths. 
Education harms learners when it teaches them to solve only the problems that they see. This one might be the hardest one to explain, but let me try. The way that our clinical education is set up, it's like an apprenticeship model. You go onto the wards or you go into clinic and you watch people take care of different conditions and different patients. And then you kind of build a model in your head around how you're gonna handle those situations in the future. And one of the problems is so often in medical education, we don't take the time to give our learners the metacognitive tools to say, how will I handle a different situation in the future that is related to this, but somewhat different. And what you end up getting is a bit of a hammer and nail phenomenon where every patient with bronchiolitis that I see in the future, I'm only gonna to try to relate it to what I've seen in the past. And it's so important that we slow down and give our learners these metacognitive tools in a deliberate way so that they can have adaptive expertise so that they know when it can be routine care, it's a routine bronchiolitis patient, but when they need to slow down and say, this is something different and how do I reason my way through it and close my knowledge or skill gaps to help take care of this patient. And so as a result of not teaching them that metacognitive skill, our learners struggle to solve novel problems of the future. Education harms learners when it stresses only personal resiliency in the face of system level dysfunction. Boy, I bet you, I bet you all feel this one. Huh? This is actually an article that one of the people who did this original workshop with me uh, sent around. And it's about moral injury, the term moral injury, which I had never heard before he sent this around, but it's a term that was mostly used in battle, in war for a long time. Uh, but now it's actually popping up all over the physician literature, which is kind of terrible. Um, and I think is a sign of the times. And this is a quote from there. The moral injury of healthcare is not the offense of killing another human in the context of war. It's being unable to provide high quality care and healing in the context of healthcare. Our learners feel this just as much as we do when our system is broken and we can't provide care to our patients in the way that we want to. And whenever the system is beating them down because of work compression and the kind of moral injury that they're suffering, and we tell them be more resilient. That's basically like the system saying, stop hitting yourself over and over and over. And this is what we often do to them. And having a conversation with learners to say, hey, we need to make it a both and, it needs to be both personal resiliency and fixing the system is really hard because as soon as you say personal resilience, they say, you're putting this on me. And as a result, our learners burn out and blame themselves. Our education harms learners when we perpetuate inequitable learner assessment. Assessment is, is what I nerd out about most of my time. I love assessment. Um, and really it doesn't matter what kind of assessment you look at. It can be quantitative ratings. It could be narrative we write. It can be standardized test scores or OSCEs. There is bias and inequity woven throughout almost all of it. Um, you can't really get away from it. And there's a lot that's been written about identifying it, which I think is a good first step. There's not a whole lot out there that, that I have found that, that tells us what to do about it. And this is a huge problem. And as a result, our learners are systematically disadvantaged and they lose trust. And this disadvantagement follows them all the way through the rest of their careers, all the way through. People are disadvantaged and their career tracks are changed. And it disadvantages our patients because we know that a diverse workforce and diverse leadership is good for our, the diversity of our patients. So this is a harm, not just to our learners, but also to our patients. Education harms learners when it takes a one size fits all curricular approach. This is like one of my personal soapboxes. When you think about how we structure medical education, a lot of people go all the way back to the Flexner report. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Flexner report. This is from back in 1910, 112 years ago. And this gentleman named Abraham Flexner was charged by the Carnegie Foundation to go do a survey of North American uh, medical uh, training institutions. And they wanted him to compare, to not just survey what they're doing, but to compare it to what a 1905 standard that had been set by what eventually became the AAMC. So old Abraham went around and looked at all these institutions and he rendered his judgment about how these schools were doing. He found many of them weren't doing great. And there were actually some unintended consequences of shutting down a lot of the schools that would admit people who weren't white males. So it kind of bottlenecked our, our uh, profession a bit. But uh, it also set the standard of saying, we want a standard curriculum for everybody to follow and that's what good medical training is. And this was a step up from before where you could just follow around a barber surgeon and lance some boils and eventually you were called a doctor. But the problem is it's based on the assumption that if you complete a standard curriculum, you are going to have similar outcomes to everybody else. And as we have moved into the competency-based education world, where we're measuring the outcomes of training, 
we're learning that is not at all true. And I think we know this implicitly. People start at different places. People grow at different rates in terms of competence and professional identity. And if you have a fixed set of time, you're going to have variable outcomes. And when that's the case, there's going to be people who are training longer than they need to be training and spending a lot of money doing it. And you're also going to have people who are graduated even when they are not trusted. This is bad for the learner and bad for our patients. If you have never been in the room of a competency committee and you're like, I don't think we graduate people when they're not trusted, um, let me show you some data. This is from a program director survey in internal medicine from 2016. And I know that's hard to read, so I'm gonna to read to you what it says. It's a statement that says, I have graduated at least one person in the last three years about whom I have concerns regarding their ability to practice independently. Basically saying, I've graduated people that I'm not sure I should have graduated. And 52% of people said, yep, sure have. And guess what? Nobody talked about this. Why was nobody talking about this? This is terrible. Another study came out in 2020. This is from over in Europe where they asked anesthesia um, educators who are in charge of uh, graduation and certification decisions. They asked them a simple question. And that question was, would you trust your loved one to every trainee that you have graduated and certified? I already see some of you like furrowing your brow and shaking your head. And 40% said no, and even more said they were unsure. What kind of baloney is this? Why would you graduate somebody? That's like being at the airport and seeing a Delta train trainer and they're like, yeah, you go on that plane. I'm not gonna go on that plane. I know that trainee, but you go on that plane. That's what we're doing. This made me so angry when I saw it. And so I did what any good scientist would do. I went to Twitter and I repeated it myself because I thought maybe this is just anesthesia in Europe. And again, 50% of people said, no, I don't trust everybody I graduate and even more pled the fifth. This is unfair to our learners and definitely unfair to our patients. And it's probably why, if you notice, when physicians go looking for a doctor, what do they do? They ask around, right? Why? Because we know there are bad doctors out there. <laughs> this is a problem. Now you might say, well, there's probably evidence out there that says if we complete a standard curriculum that it's good enough. There's some kind of evidence grounding why we do pediatrics for three years or med for four. Well, there was a group that tried to look into this a few years ago, and here was their conclusion. History has not given a clear rationale for the need of any specific length of training for medicine or a given specialty. The length of training is basically an arbitrary and historically and politically agreed upon entity that proved workable, but never had empirically argued grounding. And now that we are shifting toward outcomes of training, we are seeing, whoops, <laughs> this probably wasn't the best model. So we need to rethink that because we're causing harm. Last couple, all right, and then we're gonna take a breath. Education harms learners when it perpetuates cynical humor. Um, I love humor. I love puns. I tell lots of dad jokes. Um, I think humor is a very adaptive response to the moral injury we just talked about. So I'm not saying don't use humor. And I'm not even saying don't use gallows humor. Gallows humor, which is when we bring humor to make sense of really challenging, dark, difficult situations like a patient dying. Um, I think that can be okay. But cynical humor is distrustful and sneering and full of contempt. And so quickly we fall into that. If you're, if you're not sure what I mean, think about the book, The House of God, which most of you probably read. Very cynical book. And it was written for a purpose. It was written to shine a light on the, the just insanity of what they were going through in training at the time. So this is not the cause of what I'm talking about. But if you can think of the vibe of House of God, this is what I mean. And it permeates all throughout medicine and medical education. And as a result, our learners dehumanize patients and colleagues. Um, there's some really interesting qualitative work out there that if you ask residents and students about cynical humor, they'll tell you these like unwritten rules about when you can make fun of patients, when you can make fun of other providers. Um, and it's really sad. Uh, and guess where they learn it from? They learn it from us, right? That's what they say. We learn it from our attendings. If you wanna know some of these rules, hang on because these are really gross. This is what they said. And I'm not saying the students are gross. They're just telling us what they've learned. This is the hidden curriculum. Patients who have self-inflicted problems like obesity or substance use disorder or criminal behaviors, they're fine. Go ahead and make fun of them. People who have cancer or are pregnant or if they're kids, still fair game, but watch out because somebody might get upset. If they're terminally ill, off limits. Can't mock them, can't be cynical. And most importantly of all, mind the hierarchy. 
So you can't do it until your attending does or your fellow or your resident. So you got to make way for the people above you. So not only are we teaching them this, but they're waiting for us to do it. Um, and this is what we're teaching them. And then guess what? The cycle perpetuates. This is my last one. Education harms learners when it uses humiliation or intimidation as pedagogy. Um, I kind of thought when I was a resident that this had gone away. I didn't experience a lot of it as a resident. I did as a medical student. And I thought, oh, we're just evolving uh, as a field. Turns out it's not. It's still very, very prevalent. And a lot of people still think it's a good thing to do. This is a paper written by a couple of surgeons. I'm not trying to call them out, but I did leave their names in there. Um, and in this, they write about what it was like when they were in training. And they even use the analogy in very vivid terms about being mowed down by a machine gun on a battlefield. That's what it felt like to be questioned by their attending the way that they did it. And then they say, they're like, it's awful. There's dead bodies everywhere. And then they say, but it was probably good for us. It's like a vaccine where it hurts when you get it, but it's good for me in the long term. It's like, what? That is insane. And the term I would put to this is something that Dr. Eric Holmbo at the ACGME calls nostalgialitis imperfecta profunda, which is the good old days syndrome, right? Um, they probably think this, they look back fondly on it now. It was terrible at the time. And they think, well, it worked for me. I'm successful now, so it's probably good. There is no evidence that teaching in this way actually promotes learning. And there is evidence of harm. And it's something that we should stop. When you ask our learners about it, they say, oh yeah, it happens all the time. And when you ask them how it makes them feel, they feel shame, they feel intimidation, they feel fear. Some of them wish they hadn't gone into medicine because of it. But then do you know what else they say? They say, but it's probably good for me because otherwise why would they do it to me? This has gotta be good learning. They're preparing me for the future. And so what happens is they adopt these practices as teachers as well. And that's how it gets perpetuated uh, on down the line. If you wanna see just a snapshot of how bad this can be, there are some interesting qualitative studies where they ask residents I'm sorry, these were medical students. How do you feel when this happens to you? Don't tell us, draw it for us. And this is what they drew. Under a microscope, being run over by a truck, set on fire, getting ready to be bludgeoned by, I think that's a wrench. I've never bludgeoned somebody. Do you use a wrench to bludgeon? It's a small wrench, um, but kind of funny, but also really sad. Uh, here's another one. This is maybe my favorite. That's the chief resident with the horns. Sorry, chiefs, if you're here. And the chief says, shut up, you maggots. Tell me about this patient transfer. Speak up, intern. And what you can see is this person down here, their knees are shaking. And this person standing in a puddle, in case you weren't sure, they wrote, yep, that's P. So this is how they feel. So on top of the moral injury of working in a dysfunctional system, we're doing this to them without real benefit, at least benefit that I've ever seen. And I just went through all the literature. I couldn't find anything. So. That was my rant. Those are just some of the things that make us angry in Cincinnati. There were actually several more that again, I left out of here because of time's sake. So what I wanna do is a palate cleanser. I want you to turn to the person next to you. I'm gonna put a timer on. I'm gonna give you two minutes. I want you to talk about which of these harms really resonated with you, really made you angry, or you're like, oh yeah, that's a problem. Or which of these harms are you like, I actually don't think that's a harm at all. Or which harm did we leave off that you think is most important that should be on there? I wanna give you time to think about that and talk to the people at your table. So go ahead. I hate to, I really hate to interrupt. I love the conversation that's happening. I see lots of really engaged conversations. Maybe we should just let it go. That'd be kind of easy for me. I just walk off, <laughs> uh, but I feel like I should finish. So I, I hope some, did any of this resonate with you all? Did any of it make you angry? Good, uh, I wanted to make you a little upset or a little angry. And I would love after this, if you have other thoughts about these or other things where you're like, how could you not put this up there? That's really frustrating. I'd love to hear it. Come talk to me, come get angry with me. As long as we can be angry constructive and not angry destructive. So what I'm gonna do now for this last little bit is talk about some of the ways we tried to mitigate it in Cincinnati. Again, not because I'm holding Cincinnati up as an exemplar, but because that's the water in which I swim. And uh, maybe you've already mitigated some of these harms. And I would love to hear how you did it. So email me or let's talk after because I, I wanna do better where I'm at too. All right, so this first harm where we don't connect education with clinical outcomes, this started bothering us years ago. And we have the advantage in Cincinnati, our internal medicine residents do something called an ambulatory long block, where they spend an entire year embedded in a clinical practice, spending most of their time in clinic rather than the wards with the same staff, the same patient panel, the same faculty. And we actually track their uh, clinical
clinical outcomes. And what you'll see in this line here is all the clinical measures, I'm still sorry, I'm still learning the hang of this, all the measures right here, um, they have a target performance that's set by either the residency or the system, whether they are there or not. And then we realize that you're not always in control of that because sometimes your patient panel that you inherit just maybe isn't up to date on their colon cancer screening or whatever. So then we say, can you at least improve things by 2%? And so we say, did you either hit the goal or improve things by 2%? And we're looking for yeses over here. So these residents who are embedded in the clinical practice, seeing these patients doing population health management, get to see what happens over a year of time when they're really embedded in practice. It's really phenomenal. And we actually, um, let them have agency over which measures we follow. Every year we do something called Defense of the Measures, which is one of our most popular conferences. All of our residents, all of our clinic staff, all of our faculty come together and we debate these measures. And we say, are these measures still relevant? Is the operational definition still right? Or have the guidelines changed? Is there anything that's missing? And so we let our residents say, what are we gonna follow uh, in, in terms of their clinical outcomes? Now, this is obviously not perfect, right? The attribution of each one of these measures is not perfect to the resident, even with high continuity of care. So we don't use it for high summative decisions, but it's still really important for our learners to say, these are my care outcomes and to take ownership of the care that they deliver. Now, in the inpatient space, it's been a little trickier for us because it's more transient, right? We're only on for two weeks or four weeks, at least in our shop. Um, and it's much more team-based in the sense of, you were like working with, the senior resident and the intern and the attending and the nurse and everybody's kind of in there with their, their hands on the care. Um, but we're trying to slowly peel this apart. And we've adopted uh, an approach that was put forth by Dan Schumacher, who's actually a Peds emergency medicine doc called resident sensitive quality measures. These are measures that we think are important for care because otherwise, why do you care? And that are highly attributable to residents. Meaning we can say this measure, whether it's a process measure or an outcome measure, we think is more highly attributable to the resident's care in a defensible way. And so we're just starting in internal medicine on the wards because it's a really tricky clinical space. Dan has already done a lot of work in the peds emergency medicine world and had some success there, although it's not perfect. And since this is so murky, we're still kind of chipping away at it. Uh, we've got a team that's working with an AMA grant, Some, a couple people who are here. If you all don't know Dr. Coretta Wire and Dr. Seabox Sire, they are maybe two of the most brilliant thinkers I have ever met in my life. So find them and talk to them. But they have been kind enough to collaborate with us and a couple of folks from NYU. And we're honing in on uh, care of patients with diabetes in the inpatient space. And can we glean some process and outcome measures that we can take to our learners and say, look how you're doing when you're caring for these patients. I'm really, really excited about this work. And I think this is what every specialty and every institution should be looking into, is how do we connect education to care outcomes? When we promote poor learning strategies, I actually think this is one of the easiest ones, right? Because it's not about forcing somebody to do something, it's about opening up their thinking and letting them be curious about other ways of learning. After we match our cohort of residents, we send them one of those welcome emails like, welcome Cincinnati, our chili's terrible, but we're a fun city. Um, and then shortly after that, we send them another email that looks like this. This is actually a screenshot of the program director's email. And this email is all about learning. It's about how do you learn? And there's a link to a, a talk that we give that says, here's the evidence-based learning strategies. Here's how we use them in our program. Here's how you can use them. We give them links to audiobooks for things like Make It Stick, which are really kind of full, like fun narrative reads about evidence-based learning. We provide them links to websites like the Learning Scientists, who are two brilliant PhDs who talk about evidence-based strategies for learning. We try to get this to them early so they can start thinking about it because many of our students who are coming in have never thought about this at all. And then when they get here, Early in orientation, we say, hey, have you heard about how we think information gets into our brain? Let's talk about some of the theories and models that are out there so that they can understand the why behind things. And then we bring back those strategies and we say, here's how we're gonna implement this in our curriculum. We get this to them as early as possible. So our residents have no reason to say, I don't know about evidence-based learning strategies. And then they can choose whether or not they want to engage with them or not. Grades over growth, oh boy. Um, this one's tricky, especially in the UME space. I don't know what your medical schools are like, because I know you're not all from Stanford. Are, do you have grades or is it pass-fail? Here at Stanford. Pass-fail. So you guys got it right. Right now we have like a civil war going on in our school of medicine with half of the people wanting pass-fail and the other one having, having grades. I firmly believe it should be pass-fail and competency-based. I know there are other incentives to have the grades, but I think in UME, there's no way to get away from this until you make it pass fail and make it competency-based. 
But then once they get to residency, you often still have to deprogram people out of the fixed mindset. And so we try to leverage every longitudinal learning moment that we have. We have something called academic half day on Thursday afternoons where our residents spend three and a half hours together with the same small learning group over the course of a year and the same facilitator. And from day one, we tell them, I don't care what you know, I care what you don't know, and can you ask good questions? That's the whole point of this group. And it becomes a safe place where you don't care if you look as smart as the other person, you build trust and you say, this is where I can be curious, this is where I can leverage uh, like our, our ability to learn together and not trying to have to look smart all the time. And then our assessment system is specifically structured so that no single data point is a high stakes moment. Lots and lots and lots of tiny, tiny stakes data points. And we use them almost entirely for some, or excuse me, for formative purposes. And we're very transparent about that with our learners. All goes toward coaching, toward making them better. I think you have to structure your assessment system the same way to do it. Um, I put this here. I know this is like humble brag, but this is the thing I'm like most proud about to be part of our program. You know, we're little Cincinnati. We don't do a lot of stuff super well, but um, this thing is something we got right. We have been working forever to try to get our uh, learners to buy into growth mindset. And it's actually finally clicked in in the last couple of years. So this is a video, like most of us, when the pandemic hit, we were like, we got to make videos. We got to make our website look good. So we set up a camera. One of our administrative staff would sit there and kind of man the or person the camera. And we just had a bunch of prompts. We said, talk about whatever you want. You could talk about the city. You could talk about the wards. You could talk about, and one of the prompts was talk about growth mindset if you want to. And every single person talked about growth mindset. And I know they're on camera, so maybe you think it's performative, but watch these videos and tell me if you think it's performative. I really don't think it is. They didn't have to say anything about it and just look what they're saying. And this is what we hear in the wards too. Totally different than 10 years ago when I was a resident. Totally, totally different. It's incredible. And if you're doing this at your institution, awesome. If you're not, you got to do it because it makes all the difference in the world and how curious they are on the wards and, and the learning that, they, that can happen. In terms of assessment, I mentioned this is like, this is my thing. This is what I get excited about. This is actually one thing we do pretty well in Cincinnati. Not perfectly, but we do okay. We have what's called a program of assessment. This is the idea of building assessment tools that fit together in a deliberate way to provide a picture of how your resident is doing and then leveraging that for growth. So we have lots of what's called workplace-based assessment data where you actually go into the real world and watch them do their work. You level some ratings. And then we have some analytics that help us make sense of the data. Because one of the things that we know is, if, uh, if I give somebody a rating, a lot of that rating is depends on who am I as an assessor, what's the context I see them in, what rotation are we on, what time of year is it? And our analytics help wipe some of that away so we can make sense of the actual data that we get. We use clinical care measures, like I mentioned. We have, um, we have what we call citizenship measures, which is, are you closing your charts on time? Are you getting your refills done within 48 hours when you're on long block? Are you, um, you know, getting your flu shot when you're supposed to get it unless you have an exemption. We collect lots and lots and lots of narrative, which is probably the most important thing that we do. And we have an internal testing program that we developed over years that we don't really care about what your grade is. We care about, are you taking the tests and how are you actually engaging and learning using these resources? All right, what about teaching people only to solve the problems that they can see? This is something we just started doing. I would love to hear if you've been doing it longer because we've had really an interesting experience with it. We just started in our coaching program, starting to help people not focus on the clinical things they need to do better, but what is their metacognitive approach to learning? And we've adopted something called the master adaptive learner model. I'm sure you all have seen this before. Um, basically, it's like a plan, do, study, act cycle of how you learn. So when you're in those moments of novelty, when you encounter that bronchiolitis patient that's just not quite right, not, not like the ones you've seen before, or that pancreatitis patient that you're not sure, or that person who needs a vaccination and you don't know if it's an exemption or not, how do you plan your learning? How do you make your questions and prioritize what you need to learn? How do you use evidence-based learning strategies to close that gap or your assessment system to see if you're doing better? And then how do you know whether the thing that you just learned should become part of routine practice or only innovative thinking whenever you, you're really unsure what to do? How do you put all of that together? We have started actually mixing this into our coaching program much, much, much more. And it's totally changed the conversations we've had with our learners. It's been really fantastic. And we ask our learners, hey, are you having trouble doing this? Because this takes a lot of energy. And if so, is one of these things holding you back? This is also part of the master adaptive learner model where they say there's these batteries that power the cycle. And if you're low on curiosity, if your motivation has switched to extrinsic motivators and you don't have those, so you say, I don't wanna do this, I'm not getting a grade. You can't find that intrinsic motivation. Or you've gone into a fixed mindset. 
or you're, the system is really beating you down. Um, can we talk about that? And how do we get back to where you have the energy to do this deliberate learning? So our coaching conversations have switched from coaching competence as clinicians to coaching competence and identity as learners, which is totally different for us. It's going from what to how. If we can teach them the how, they can find the what themselves. So I really think this metacognitive thing is just like something that was totally lacking for, much, for, for most medical education programs, and it's got to be behind everything that we do. What about resilience and burnout? I think the first thing is just to acknowledge that it's hard to have the discussion about resiliency without talking about individual resiliency and system level burnout and acknowledge that residents are gonna get mad when you bring it up. We had like a near revolt when this came out. Have you all seen this before? From Milestones 2.0. Um, if you don't know what a mile, the milestones are, it's a framework for de tracking development of residents over time. And we just revised them. And one of them that made it in, I was on the writing team for internal medicine and I said, we shouldn't do this as did some other people, but we did anyway, is knowledge of systemic and individual factors of well-being. So this is saying that the program should assess whether the learner has knowledge of systemic and individual factors of well-being. So what do you think our learner said when they saw this? They said, you're gonna assess my well-being while I'm in this system that is constantly beating me down? Now to the ACGME's credit, they actually say really clear right here in this tiny little font, the subcompetency is not intended to evaluate a resident's well-being. Rather, the intent is to ensure that resident has the knowledge of factors that impact well-being, which I get it, right? We need to make sure they have the tools to be well, but that is not how our learners hear it because of this dynamic of system versus individual. And I think there was a lot of, there was a lack of nuance around this whole conversation and rollout. And I think acknowledging that, getting that on the table, letting people vent their frustration is the first step. But then the second step is to engage learners in the improvement process, not make them do it, but to say, we hear you, the system is broken. We're gonna to try to fix it as best we can. And we wanna invite you if you want to, to help us fix it. So every year in Cincinnati, we have a list of improvement groups and we say, come join us. Here's the faculty that'll be working on it. If you're passionate about it, join on. This is maybe the most successful thing we do every year. Um, in fact, I got this text. This is no joke. The day I left to come here, I got this text from one of our residents. This is not at all staged. They said, we just had the MICU improvement group and it was even more impressive than I expected. Drew, who is the chief who ran it, is a rock star. I'm not part of the MICU improvement group. They just texted this to me. And I said, yes, totally agree. Glad it was generative. Thank you for donating your time. And she wrote back, of course, if we're going to ask for change, putting in time to help is the bare minimum we can do. She didn't have to do that. But the invitation and then being transparent about the changes that you're making show people that you are working on the systems changes and not just saying this is on you. I think that's the conversation that you have to have. Inequitable learner assessment. Catherine Lucy has called this a wicked problem because I don't think there is an answer. I haven't seen an answer so far. But in this paper, if you have a chance to read it, they talk about some things that are really helpful. In general, like using criterion-based assessment, using quantitative and qualitative, getting lots of different assessors to assess your learners. I think those are all really important for high quality assessment in general. But I think there are some other things we could consider too, like bias training, which is probably not sufficient, but probably rec like bare minimum required to have these reflective conversations. I don't think you can de-bias somebody. I really don't. Maybe I'm wrong. It's not my field of expertise. I haven't seen good evidence about it, but I think it's important to have these discussions to start. Then we got to get better diversity of our assessors which in Cincinnati is really challenging. I'm sure it's challenging other places too. And then we're starting to play with this idea of using learning analytics to try to identify where bias is taking place. Can we see evidence of bias using that same analytics that I was telling you before, and even using natural language processing to say, when do we see gendered language? When do we see language that is biased against somebody because of their ability or their race or their ethnicity or where they train? Then the last thing is again, I mentioned using care measures and assessment. Let's just take the assessors out of it. Um, wouldn't that be an interesting step? Now, I don't think we could say this is gonna be the answer because people thought taking the assessors out of it using standardized test was the answer, and that clearly didn't pan out, but I think this would be a step moving forward. Last couple, using a one size fits all curricular approach. You probably get the underlying tone. I think we should have time variable training. There's a lot of challenges with that. Happy to talk with you about them because I've thought about them a lot. Uh, but we've been piloting it in Cincinnati and we've had some really, really fascinating outcomes in terms of not just how has it impacted our learners, but how has it affected our competency committee and the threshold we set to move somebody forward. Punchline is it's a lot higher 
because we want to really be sure because we are not just defaulting to some time-based uh, thing where we say, oh, it's 36 months. We'll let you go even if we don't trust you. It doesn't happen anymore. And there are a lot of other places that are piloting this type of thing as well. Cynical humor. Oh man, this is tough. I don't think you can just stamp this out and I don't think you should because people are gonna roll their eyes at you. But I do think you need to uh, provide healthy places to express healthy humor, humor built around empathy and humanizing patients. We do something called Finding Meaning in Medicine, which uh, was an initiative from the Institute of Study of Health and Illness. I don't know if y'all have these sessions as well, but you share humanizing stories around patients and we deliberately weave humor into it to get people laughing and modeling what does good generative humor look like and we try to empower people when you're on in clinical spaces that faculty are not. How do you address somebody when you hear this cruel, cynical humor? How do you diffuse that situation without alienating somebody? Um, we, we make that a, a deliberate part of our curriculum. And the last thing, using humiliation or intimidation. This one is the easiest. Are you ready? Just be kind. Uh, spread kindness because it's super easy not to humiliate or intimidate someone. Um, and it's hard sometimes hierarchy becomes transparent to us as we move up the hierarchy, but try not to lose sight of it. So these are the harms that we just went through. I hope if nothing else, this talk has gotten you fired up about one of these harms or about something you've been thinking about. And I want you to go forward and I want you to do something about it. Um, and I want you again to remember that despite all these harms, these people are incredible and they're doing incredible things and providing incredible care. And medical education is doing a lot to help them, but we can do even, even better. Because imagine if instead of promoting all these things with these harms, we help learners become even more growth oriented, informed, ready for practice, curious, accountable, supported, kind, adaptive, empathic change agents. That's what we try to get to. That's why we got all angry about this. And I think we can get there. So that's the end of my talk. This is the gift I send my wife anytime we have a parenting fail. She loves it. And I'm sure she would be real excited to know that I'm sharing it with you, which she doesn't. Um, but anyways, thank you for this. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to conversations with you afterwards. Thank you. But my question is, when I'm teaching, I like asking students a lot of questions. And I do sometimes put people on the spot. And I think most people roll with that and expect that that's just a part of learning is they're going to ask questions, they have to answer them. And some people find that more intimidating than others. So do you have any thoughts on how to preserve the value of Socratic questioning with people not finding it overly intimidating? Great question. And there's not a one size fits all answer. There's a really good paper from uh, medical education by Rudland et al a few years ago, where they built this conceptual kind of roadmap of all the things that factor into how does a learner react to questioning in the clinical environment? And it's a lot of stuff, right? It's their personality, their mindset, the program support system, their previous experiences, your relationship with them, all these really dynamic factors. And there's no way you can write a prescription for that. But I think the most important things are, number one is to set expectations. Number two is to build a relationship with your learners, which you can do in a short period of time, because if they trust that you're asking them for their best interest, um, they're, they're going to be more okay with it. And then circle back and see how it went. If there's somebody who just panics when you ask them questions, don't do it because they're going to panic. Because some people, I don't know if you had those learners, they just freeze and panic. And that's just not the kind of person you can ask those questions with. It's all about educational safety, which is really, really complex and difficult. Um, but I do want to be clear because um, I had a colleague who, when I talk about this, they're like, I disagree. I think putting people on the spot and challenging them is, is, is important. And I say, I think it's really important to push people, um, but you don't have to humiliate them. And so you have to have safety. And one of the phrases that our program director uses is safe, but not soft. Um, it has to be educationally safe. So when I make it hard and you fail, or when you say, I don't know, it's okay. Um, but you don't go, it doesn't have to be soft. Um, and the, the single most important thing I think you can do is to role model that. So I'm sure many of you do this, but when I'm on service all the time, I ask a question. I'm like, you know why I'm asking this question? I have no idea what the answer is. Um, does anybody know? And if you do, great. And if not, let's learn it together. The other thing I do is anytime I'm on service, I always present at least two or three patients myself, even when I'm on a full resident team. Do you know why? Because I make mistakes. Because I forget to look for the Foley catheter. Because I forget that they're not on DVT. Pro. Something will happen and they see me making mistakes. And then hopefully it helps them feel okay making mistakes. I don't have any empirical evidence of that, but I try to flatten that hierarchy as much as possible. So when I ask them a question, 
they don't feel attacked. And then I can circle back later and say, how'd you feel about that? Is that okay? Okay, great. Uh, and if they say no, and then I say, why? What can I do to make it better? Thank you. Oh, I'm good. So question uh, on Zoom. So let me, let me read this. Um, I, it says, I definitely that teach be for growth mindset and, min and minimal safe level of confidence. Um, unfortunately, giving and receiving feedback is difficult for high achieving individuals. Some get defiant and, um, and motivated to improve. Some are demoralized um, and some ignore the feedback if not pointed enough. And really get into the question of uh, what should we be doing about this? Um, let me uh, go on this question. Um, are there requirements on fuzzy statistics and expert opinions? And depending on your state, cultural, culturally, politically correct opinions, is the bar too high or too low? And are we unconsciously applying our own parenting tendencies, experiences to the workspace? Um, <laughs> it's a lot. I don't. I don't know that I get the. I don't know that I fully understand the the specific question. Other than if it's about just how to give feedback the right yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and that, assessment. Are we setting the bar too high, too low? Oh, I don't think so. I think we should set the bar at what is, what would make you feel comfortable letting this person care for your loved one. Like it's a pretty simple bar to me. Um, whether you use the ACGME milestones or EPAs or whatever, that's where we should be saying this is the bar. For competent practice. Now, that doesn't mean that's where they should stop. Uh, that just means that where they, that's where they need to get to be there. In terms of people being receptive to feedback, that's a really challenging thing, and that's where relationship comes in. I know there's a, a you know, coach. Y'all are like the coaching mecca, and I know there's a workshop on coaching today. Um, we have really leaned into our coaching model for a lot of this. In fact, our program directors don't give feedback to our learners anymore. Feedback is given to them, and they have discussions with their coach. And then they can debrief with the program director, but they actually get to have these conversations um, in a safe space without a hierarchy there. Doesn't mean the program director doesn't see it. Just means they're not the one there giving them that feedback. Uh, and when you have a relationship with somebody, I think it makes it a little easier. Although, you know, right now who um, isn't, isn't getting it uh, and you can't win them all, unfortunately. He's still gonna do okay but I don't think he's gonna do as well as he could. So, well, thank you so much. And I saw one more question, Betsy. I had a question about the personal resiliency piece because I struggle with this a lot of acknowledging the system challenges while not creating a culture of blame because I see this in our trainees and I see them as they enter as faculty too, that they think of it all as being external and out of their control and a lot of blame and it gets very unproductive, I think, for them. Um, but at the same time, obviously, we can't put it all on the individual. Yeah, I think a really good framework for thinking about this, have you all ever re uh, heard of the term polarity management, polarity thinking? It's the idea that we often create false dichotomies, either or. Um, and there are a lot of things that are actually a both and. And how do you have discussions uh, around a both and? And I think this is the crux of the problem. It is definitely a both and. You should be able to have conversations around personal resilience skills, not only because you know, it's something that we ought to do, but like it's genuinely going to benefit somebody to learn about personal resilience. And systems issues are a lot of what drive problems, not, if, not for everybody, but for most. And so I think where we're really mostly failing is everything, everyone sees it as an either or. Um, and as soon as you have that conversation at all about personal resilience, a lot of learners get defensive, get angry, say you're blaming me. So I think before we even get into trying to improve resilience, we have to have that discussion and get that down first. And I think we have had more success starting every discussion with the system side of things, not exonerating people from any personal responsibility, but to say, boy, our systems, they're really, like we have a real problem in Cincinnati with work compression, um, with the way our flow is set up. So we say, we have a real problem with work compression and here are the people that we're working with to make it better. And as you're in this system, how can we help you get through it even better? Let's talk about that. Um, and they're a little bit less cynical about it when we, when we take that approach. But again, we don't have like a, a perfect solution because these, these conversations still go sideways sometimes, but um, you gotta get people thinking in the both and. Barry Johnson is, is the person who wrote the book, Polarity Management. It's a really, it's actually kind of a dry book, but the concepts are really, really good. And you can draw something called a polarity diagram where you can try to leverage the upsides of both ends of a polarity uh, and minimize the downsides. It's a good way of thinking about it. Really, really excited about the as well. 
Ben, thank you so much for getting us uh, thinking, questioning, wondering, and uh, importantly, making plans of how do we make medical education and health professions education even stronger. So thank you for coming today and presenting. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.